What are the obstacles that sideline believers to participate in God's mission? In other words, there are obstacles, and if I'm really honest, if I look back 40 years of what I've been doing, I'm essentially a mobilizer. I'm here to get your gift work and, and for the kingdom of God. So I'm going to give, there are more, but I'm going to give you six obstacles I see that if we can deal with them, we will actually get the bottleneck open a bit more and everybody can participate. So are you keen to see the six areas I've selected? Let's just see if I'm even right. Okay, so the first one is, I battle with sin. Sally Salmon, I saw you somewhere here. Almost 40 years ago, we used to go to those Rema celebrations. Can you remember? And I only remember once, we sat there, and the first speaker, the speakers used to sit in the lounge and come out, so they didn't necessarily hear what the other guy said. This guy preached. He said, God can only use clean vessels. That's what he said. And spoke about holiness. And, and then he did an altar call. And all of us repented of our sin to be holy, to be used by God. And amen. So it was tea time, and then the next speaker came up. Guess what the speaker said? He says, God can use anybody, even a donkey. So now all of us who are clean realize we could have been used even when we were dirty a little bit. I think they're truths both ways. So, so the point is that I would like to make, my experience is because all of us are battling with sin and stuff that makes us feel inadequate and reluctant can subconsciously cause the majority of those who battle to never volunteer. I know what it is to be young and to have a half young church. We have altar calls, and I see young guys standing in front, weeping and crying. I know already why they're there. They're battling with their sexuality. I know it. And unless I can teach them how to be victorious over that, but because they have certain habits, they feel like I can't be used by God. So here's the thing, and I'm not here to preach the points really. I'm just saying an obstacle is I battle with sin. So here's the thing. Can you imagine in your family you've got a naughty child? And then you've got like a model child. The first thing you don't need to do is to compare the two. That's what happens in the family. You should be like your brother. And then can you imagine that you give all the duties to the responsible child, and the other one gets nothing to do because they're not good enough. So in God's kingdom, we can be used by God even though you're battling with things. I can give you lots of scriptures. So you need to know theologically that I am saved and not sit and wonder if I'm going to hell or not to hell, if I can be used or not used. If you're in Christ and born again, you're a child of God, even though you might be a naughty child. And even naughty children must participate. So we are saved, we are sealed, and we are secure in our salvation. So the Bible teaches us there's a past tense of salvation. You are saved, past tense and sealed. Then there is a continuous, there's a present tense, the sanctification. Get your salvation to work. You might not be perfect yet, but get it to work. But if you don't know if I'm saved or not saved, guess what? We have to that percentage of people that will never volunteer. I've got much more to say. Go and think about this one. I'm not saying sin is okay. But I'm saying 
God can use even a naughty Christian. Obviously, if you battle with stealing, we're not going to ask you to look after the church's money. <laughs> and if you're battling with, you know, like, there's, there's a adultery in your history, we're not going to ask you as a guy to go and visit single women. We're not going to be stupid. But you can participate with your problems. I think we must discuss this. It's a big point I'm raising. It's a theological dilemma. But I'm saying this issue sidelines Christians not to participate in the mission more than we realize. And we don't know. It's like the elephant in the room. We don't know what to do with it. We don't know what to say. I'm bold enough to say, like some people say, are you saying once saved, always saved? I'm saying when you're saved, you're saved. And I'm saying, deal with the idols of your heart. There's a lot of repentance necessary. There's a lot of dealing with your stuff. It's not okay. But at least be sure that you're God's child. And if you're God's child, participate in the mission. And part of the idea is to deal with the issues you need to deal with. That was point number one. Point number two. I'm not a pastor. The biggest problem is that if you think that the pastor, the trained clergy, must do the ministry, you will by default be a consumer. To me, it's one of the biggest. It happened many years. The early church was hijacked through Constantine and others, and the church started to be a clergy laity divide, and then it sidelined people to say, I'm not good enough. I'm not trained enough. I can't do it. I can't lead somebody to Christ. The pastor must. I can't visit somebody. Sometimes in the church too, when you have a need and one of the members visit, you say, where's the pastor? It doesn't feel like a genuine visit because the pastor must come. So it sidelines all the ministers to participate because we're all ministers because you say, I'm not a pastor. I'm talking about a trained clergyman or woman. It's a problem. It sidelines people. Are there those who are called by God to equip? Yeah. But don't, don't let this thing sideline you. Let God use you according to your gifting. Let God use you irrespective of gender, irrespective of age, irrespective of culture. We are all ministers of the living God. We are all He's priests, and we're all missionaries, I said last Sunday. Deal with this one so that you don't feel. I can't tell you how often that I mentored leaders, and then they say, it's easy for you because people call you pastor. If I was just, if you just give me the title pastor, then I can do what you do. That's what people default thinking. And I'm trying to get rid of what they want. It's like putting yourself on a bus and the bus doesn't even go where you need to go. So all I'm saying here is an issue that sidelines people from God's mission is saying, I am not a trained minister. I'm not a pastor. I don't have a title. I'm not a clergy. We need to, as a church and a community, break down the divide. We've got a variety of gifts. Some of us are to pastor. Others are to lead. But we are all ministers. That was point number two. It's a big point. Number three. I don't have what is needed. You just, you just feel like too broke. Too unspiritual. As a matter of fact, some of us have a theology where you have to beg for things. I hear people still say, I'm fasting for A, B, and C. I hear people say that. I'm, what, what do you do? No, I'm busy fasting for this A, B, and C. And I'm thinking, okay, so at the cross, Jesus paid for everything. You feel to pay for something through fasting. How, how does it even work? So, here is the answer to the question, I don't have what it takes. 
And I want to say to you, everything you need to live a fruitful life is already within you. Ephesians 1, 3 says, I have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That heavenly places is not the sky. It's in a realm that you can't see. So guess who lives within you? Jesus is within you. The Father's love is within you. The Holy Spirit is within you. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not observed. Where is it? Within you. So when you pray, let thy kingdom come, you're not praying some mysterious prayer for pulling something from the sky to the earth. You're giving God permission to release what is within you, his kingdom, outward. The Bible says he's given you gifts. It's within you to bless everybody. Can you see? As you sit here today, you have all as a deposit in you what it takes. You just need to be plugged into the vine. You'll be sidelined if you think, I don't have anything. And you're going to end up begging for what you already have. Can you see how it can sideline you? So according to your call, the needs around you, you will find that God has already deposited within you. You're like a seed. You're a seed that needs to be planted and germinate. You are a son of the kingdom called a seed of God. I think I made my point. Then the next one is, I don't know where my mission field is. There is super, you know, we, we preach, go and make disciples. We think, where's the mission field? Where's the mission field? It sidelines people. And part of that is we've got in our minds a spiritual secular divide. In other words, the pastor does spiritual work and the teacher does secular work. No, we all do spiritual work. The mission field is your community, your connections. When it says go, for most of us, we're already there. There, there. there will be room for us, some of us, to go to other cities and other nations. But generally in a congregation like this, it could be 1%, maybe 5%. If we are fortunate, that will actually be relocating somewhere else. But the majority of us, our mission field is where you are. Your mission field has got at least, your community has got eight connections. You've got a connection with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've got a connection with your family. You've got a connection with somebody you walk with. You've got a, com a connection with your community group, a small group. You've got a connection with a ministry team. You participated. You've got, a co you've got a connection with the celebration here. You've got a connection with a place where you work or where you live. And we have your social connections. Your mission field is what you need to be equipped for. That's where you have been mobilized. It should be the core around when Christian Center, we say, deployed everywhere. That's exactly what we mean by that phrase. You are deployed in a community that's yours and your mission field, and you need to be equipped for it because it was a whole spectrum of relationships. So the, 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 the obstacle is, I don't know where my mission field is. doesn't feel spiritual to be a doctor. doesn't feel spiritual to be a accountant. doesn't be, feel spiritual to be a domestic worker. Domestic workers, father and mother, the nation's children. Let's give respect and honor for where God has deployed us. And then I think my second last one is, I did not know that doing good is as important as pursuing spiritual, supernatural gifts. My observation is we as charismatics have preached the supernatural so hard that if you can't do a miracle or something supernatural, you don't know how to be used. And the other day when I preached there where Jesus says, I, uh, he says, you will do the works I've done. That word works, he's not referring to signs and miracles, he's referring to good deeds. I want to say to you, the one is not above the other. They work hand in glove. But don't underestimate, too few people are underestimating the good you can do every day. A congregation like this, a couple, let's say we are 300 people here. And if we do one kind deed, Every day, seven times 300 is 2,100, right? Is that right, Bernard? 2,100. 2,100 times four 
is 8,400, 8,400 hits for the kingdom every month from here. You do two a day, become 16,000. You do three a day, and we can do that. See, what sidelines us, we don't know the smile you give, the gift you give, the food you give, the hug you give, and be open to the supernatural. Because God will use words of knowledge. He will use words of wisdom. You'll lay hands on the sick. But what we must do. So when it says greater works will we do than Christ. It's not referring to miracles. Because we, we've, none of us has ever done something greater Christ has done in terms of miracles. But he says your influence circle. Some of you can go on your phone. Send a positive message. And you reach more people that Christ reached in his days. You will do greater works. You have greater opportunities. That's what he's saying. Please, this to me is very important. That's why I know in the UK we're going to have a cotton conference. We're going to call it naturally supernatural. Because sometimes we just focus so much on the supernatural that we don't realize God uses the natural. Like when you plant a seed, you can produce a harvest. It's naturally supernatural. Hear me well. I'm not saying either or. I say both. I don't devalue the one above the other. And then lastly, and then I'm done, is the gospel really that powerful? I like to use this illustration. It's a bit silly. But I know if a doctor comes to his London who deals with cancer and starts to have 80%, 90% success rate, the whole East London will know about that doctor. Everybody knows. Everybody actually knows who are the good lawyers and the bad lawyers, the good doctors and the bad doctors, the good churches and the bad churches, the good pastors and the bad pastors, if there's people like that. The same. We can make Jesus famous if we believe that he can really save people. The gospel, the good news, God's intervention plan for mankind is so powerful that it saves people. I will never withhold. Because if you don't understand that, when you don't know that you have, it's like a salesman. Can you imagine you have to sell a product that breaks guaranteed in the first month? How will you sell that product? I, I don't think you can. You, you'll be so desperate. And, and, and so you can't. But if you've got something you believe everybody needs, it's death and life in it, guess what you will do? So I would say another thing that sidelines believers, we have lost our fascination and the power of God's salvation plan that there's a miracle that could happen when you with the Holy Spirit witness to somebody and you get to the place where you say to them, don't you want to open your heart and receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? He's got the power to rescue you and change you and, 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 and steer your destiny into a wonderful eternity. If you don't have confidence in this, get what? You don't participate. Because what is our plan at the end of the day? Our plan is for people to receive God, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior. Hallelujah. Six things. I said things that sideline us, I think, when we battle with sin and we don't know how to overcome and become victorious and it sidelines us. May God give you grace here this morning. You can say, I'm not a pastor. I, I'm not qualified, I think I said today, in Christ, you have already been, permission has been granted. You can participate. We said, I might not have it. I say, no, it's within you. Give it a try. Others says, I don't know where to go. I don't know where my mission field. I says, it's right around you. You are planted there. You're right in the middle of it. And then we said, I, I, I didn't know that my normal things are powerful just as supernatural things and then I also said some of us don't realize how powerful the gospel is the gospel message that we carry that brings salvation to mankind hallelujah
Oh, 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 oh,